Yes. How do people select their partners in this community? Um, how does it work? How does it work? There's there's a long period of um, of dating, you know that or. Yeah, uh, it, it spans from early adolescence to your 20s, in which uh, men and women are, uh, you know, under usually under adult supervision of some sort. You know, befriending others, and and uh, you know, there's a there's a lot of drama <laughs> that goes on there, um, and it's not until usually, you know around 18, 19, 20, that a young man and a woman will first sort of officially uh, marry. And typically what happens, especially with the first marriages, is that a young man is expected to live in the camp that his young wife is located in. This is uh, bride service, which is uh, very common with a lot of forager populations and with the Hadza in particular. And so young men are living with their young wives and typically the, the, the parents are in the same camp. Um, and, but in general, what I would say is that, you know, there's a huge amount of freedom. You know, there's, 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 no, there, there's no hint of an arranged marriage norm or uh, practice among the Hadza. Women have a lot of freedom. They're free to go if they feel like it. Divorces happen like this. Um, you just take up residence with another person. And, uh, and so divorce, the Hadza are, are, are quite famous for having a very high divorce rate. Um, and there's been a lot of good work upon that subject. What sort of mediates the fact that women are able to, you know, easily switch, and men as well. And it has something to do with the general amount of independence in Hadza society. You know, the food acquisition speaks to this, and that men and women are approximately acquiring the same amount of foods. And so you're not going to be, in the near term, in really bad shape if you strike out on your own. So this amount of, this sort of gives people a high level of independence. You know, you always have kin who, who might help you out. And, uh, and so the marriages are quite fluid. Um, and in general, it's, it's, it's very much a self-selecting thing. You, know, you, you choose the person that you want to be with and try your best to convince them that you're a good match. Dan? So very nice presentation and great data. Um, it strikes me that there is an, an additional pathway that you didn't have on your chart, yes. um, uh, which is maybe a little bit difficult to tease out in the future, but not impossible. And that's that positive assortment um, could be affecting fertility and child growth and development by virtue mm -hmm. of the genetic quality of the parents. Sure. So if, sure. if fathers are producing more than, if some men are producing more than other men by virtue of the you know, propitious nature of sure. their particular genetic combination, and sure. mothers likewise, and those two individuals get together, sure. then their children are going to put on yeah. weight more, um, yeah. survive better, right. and so on. Yeah. So you would need some you know, some completely independent measure like fluctuating asymmetry or something yeah. like that to yeah. try and work immune response potentially to try and gauge that. Yeah, I think, I think the genetic covariance, you know, of course, between close relatives is, is very much an important element of the story. I think, nevertheless, no matter how good your genes are, you still need to be fed. So um, even if your child, even if you have genes that predispose you to being able to be a successful food producer, you still need to get food into your child's mouth. So the, inter the intermediate process there is still important, the food sharing. But I don't, I don't mean to take away from that critical um, confound, not really confound, just reality. And I think immune function is a good uh, possible genetic component that would affect both your likelihood of being able to get up out of bed one day and go foraging and also, you, it would also allow your children to thrive at the same time. So I think that's a, that's a good candidate for a general sort of genetic component that's going to cause both things, the children's outcome and, and foraging behavior, to, to be successful. I think it's a good point. Yes? Um, so you showed us the data that, that indicate that um, the distribution of 
food was nepotistic. So that yeah. husbands can and wives can got more than um, Yeah. And then you said that it was strategic, but it seems to me to um, to make that claim you need also to show us that uh, that the distribution of food differs mm -hmm. from the actual distribution or the composition of the camps. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could talk about that. Sure. Um, well, in this in, in this analysis, uh, I probably didn't I didn't explain it well enough. Um, in this analysis, I'm giving a um, as the as the denominator is the number of different kin of different categories. Um, it's if you're in that category, what is your likelihood of eating any amount of food? So, if you're right to make, you're right to point out the fact that because the Hadza live in camps that have uh, a greater number of kin than non-kin, if they just shared foods indiscriminately, right. there would be a kin bias. Right. But what that analysis shows is that if you're in a camp with a Hadza who produces food, you have a greater probability than non-kin. So it's, it's showing you that there's a, a bias within the camp of food sharing going to related individuals. So th I think this does indicate that there, there is a strategic uh, component to it. Talk yes? About later. Okay, I'll show you the analysis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, what yeah. about paternity certainty? Is yeah. the kinship based on what people say, or um, are are some of these successful hunters um, following foods elsewhere? Yeah, that's, that raises a, a very important um, element to all of this, which is that the, the reproductive payoffs going to men in, through affairs or um, just more subtle forms of reproductive success you know, is something that we'd all like to know more about, and we'd all like to get accurate sexual histories of, of men to know paternity, but it's, paternity is the kind of thing where we can definitely, we can, we can, we can question our subjects and ask them, okay, is that, are you, do you really mean you're the one who, who is r really the father? You know, we can, we can get past the first paternal ascription, you know, saying who's the father of this child or who are your children, and we can, you know, oftentimes uncover more of the story than what you might get at first glance, but you know, the paternity certainty can only go so far. Our data only permit us to, to get a certain level of accuracy of paternity. And, and, and um, if there is a payoff um, to food sharing um, that's going to other children who might be in the same camp who we don't know exactly who the father is. Sure, there's uncertainty there. I mean, we don't know. We don't. We can't say for sure who, who everyone's uh, parents well, are. We the just. The idea of um, a male hedges his bets by provisioning his sister's kids. Yeah, that makes a, a lot of sense. You know, because there's there's greater uh, certainty of parentage in the, in the female line. So I think there's um, that's actually one of a host of number of hypotheses that might very well be at work here showing the the importance of co-residence with uh with the wives kin you know so so you can't get a little blood sample uh we can and uh then we'd be barred from working in tanzania for the rest of our lives oh. um <laughs> this road has been traveled before to 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 a, a negative outcome so um you know the it's it's actually um Given the likelihood of us getting kicked out of Tanzania for arbitrary reasons, the fact that we're still there from Nick's pioneering work to the present says a lot about our caution, you know, doing this kind of stuff. So blood is a, is a really tricky subject. We would love to get it to look at immune function and things like that, um, but it's, it, can, it can really cause trouble for everyone, as it has in the past. I think Nick should go next. I want to go back to the early part of your talk and it really looks as if there's a huge difference between what you saw and what we saw. Yeah. Or have you figured out that that's an illusion or what Well, you know, about? I'd I'd like to go with you to the field. <laughs> I think that would be the best I think that would be the best thing to do actually. Uh, but I've you know, I I understand that there's a um, 
I'm telling a different story in terms of large game than what's been told before. We have different data sets. You know, our data say different things. I haven't figured it out. I have not figured out what leads to that outcome. There's a lot of things that could potentially contribute to this. Um, and it could be methodological differences. It could be change in, through time. It could be um, we worked with different subpopulations of Hadza who do things differently. I mean, there's a host of reasons why um, uh, the research, the food sharing uh, data presented by Hawks and what I've presented are, are different. And it's, it's troubling, and, and I, I think we, uh, we just need to try to, to, to look at different possible explanations for this. One thing that I've looked at um, is the relative profitability of large game hunting during the two periods of our field work. Um, if large game are depleted, now, relative to when work was done with the Hadza in the mid 80s, um, you might expect a shift in prey choice going towards smaller animals, and you might also, you know, the, the value of large game might have, have shifted relatively. And you could, you could almost, you could predict an effect either way um, in terms of whether individuals would be sharing more or keeping more. So it's, it's hard for me to look at the differences between our data sets and make a prediction about which way it should go in some cases. But in this particular case, I found that at least in the dry season component of our data sets, the, the, the relative productivity of large game hunting is essentially the same. I calculated as one uh, successful kill per 30 hunter days. And um, in, the, in the work from the mid 80s to the later 80s, um, it was, depending on the season, one per 27 days a successful large animal. However, the ov I think the, the overall size of the animals that they're killing now is, has reduced. So I think the per kilo per day food return from large game hunting has decreased. Um, and uh, there's a lot of factors that could be at work here. That I, I, I lots of your data is from people east of the lake, but yeah. a lot of your food sharing is from west. Yeah, with the large game, with the large game, um, uh, the the success rate of hunting large game was very high in the west side of the lake. So there's a regional difference that could that could be at play here. So in terms of the um, food production data, number of days, the large game, uh, the west side of the lake, um, is about a uh, sixth of, of the total amount of days. But in terms of the amount of animals I have being distributed, it's, uh, it's closer to a half of all the animals. So there's a possible regional difference at play as well. Could potentially be at work here. Yes, Sarah? Um, so I was wondering for the large game funds, what is the mean size of the hunting farm? And how you were assigning producership in those analysis? Yeah, the the mean size of a hunting party um, is around 1.2 when we look at hunting forays. Um, so who was out doing the hunting was pretty unambiguous because men typically hunt uh, solitarily, especially when they're going for large game. So um, I think I had one or two cases in my data set where I had to question people about, okay, who, who really killed this animal? So. Um, it was the ascription that I made was the same as what Hadza use, and it's you know who who shot the animal. So that's that's what I used. That's my indicator. Yes. Just a quick follow up to that. So <clears throat> you kill a large animal that's too big to carry back. Yeah. How do you protect it against scavengers? Other human scavengers or <laughs> other animal scavengers? <laughs> um, successfully get the meat back to camp. Yeah, that's a good question. There's. Um, the typical way you would do it is uh, you, f you, f you would find the animal dead and to protect it from other scavengers, you can, I've seen men lift it up into a tree, um, which hyenas have a hard time climbing trees, especially really thorny uh, comifera trees. They, don't, they can't climb them. So, so uh, they'll hoist, hoist the food up into a tree, somewhat like what a leopard does. Um, and other instances, if there's no trees nearby, what they'll do is they'll cut a lot of thorn brushes and lay it on top of the animal. And they also have some, some beliefs about you know, ways to fend off um, 
vultures from spotting the animal, and they do some some ritual things. But um, but typically, it's been it's either put up a tree or, or covered with thorn branches to to keep a a scavenger away. Brooke? Um, I'm curious about this um, phenomenon of the guy handing the prey over to his wife when mm -hmm. he gets into camp. Yeah. So does that mean that she is then controlling the primary distribution of that animal? Well, if it's a... Uh, so in, in the case of honey and small game, I code that as the primary distribution. And yes, she would be in charge of the, of the uh, subsequent distribution that occurs. Okay, so. so you code it as the primary distribution is husband to wife, not wife divides the small game up into... Well, well actually, in the, in the case of honey, I, I, I have it coded as husband giving directly to the wife. That's the primary distribution. The reason why I do that is because there's no food prep involved. You can just eat honey right away. Whereas with small animals, there needs to be a, a butchery if it is going to be distributed. And so it's the raw shares, it's where the raw shares are going, which is the primary distribution. And it would be, uh, it would be the wife, basically, in that case, would be the administrator to, to a primary distribution. And did you find any differences between if the, the wife was the primary distributor versus the husband? Yeah. Um, so in my complete distributions, I have the whole path diagrams of transfers and, and, and consumption. And the level that I've analyzed it at here is just the acquirer and his relationship to all the sort of tips of the branch of the network. I haven't looked at um, the relative kin bias that might exist when a wife is giving out the food versus a, versus a, a husband, but I could do that. Um, it's, a, it's a really good point. Yes. So there are two questions. One is, now that I hear that you put only the person who shot the animal is producer, if you were to divide up the non-producers into other people who are on the patent, how does that work? Is there a difference between them? Oh, okay. So, if yeah, um, that uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and if we, and I, and I think you probably would actually, if there were two individuals out hunting together and. You know, it, it is a cooperative affair. Um, so I would predict that you would. Um, I, don't, I don't think my data are really adequate to look at that, because like I said, it was unambiguous in, in all the cases, and it was a solitary acquisition. So, yeah. But I think you'd expect that, you know, uh, sort of preference in sharing. Yeah. Especially given that you mentioned recently that there is prior divorce rates and yeah. possibly various child children to be and um, yeah. have you seen does it are you there's something that the fact that there's there's special female kin were getting less than males kin in the that it came out quite uh, it was quite a surprise to me to see that um, consanguineal kin of the producer had a higher probability of eating than affinal kin. And the reason it's a surprise is that I've, I have tabulated um, of all the transfers, you know, uh, that occur within these 52 complete food distributions, the number of transfers by the wife as the donor compared to the husband. And it's clear that the wife is, a, is really overseeing the distribution of the foods, you know. Um, and to find, nevertheless, a higher probability of, of the producer's kin eating than the wife's kin was very surprising to me because I, I think wives have a, a huge amount of control over the hearth or over sharing, any kind of sharing within the household. Um, and you're right to point out the fact that, um, you know, there, there's definitely a conflict of interest that could occur between wanting to, you know, support either the husband's kin or the wife's kin, you know, and that's something that the Hudson negotiate every day because they typically live by, by, by locally, you know, with, um, with both some husband's kins and, and wife's kin. So they have a trend towards a sort of local residence. Yeah. I wish I could say, you know, if there was a difference in uh, stepchildren versus um, the producer's biological children, but I, I really would expect there not to be, um, knowing how 
wives are uh, play such a prominent role in distributing the food. So I think it's it's more their decision of who to give it to, and they're surely going to be giving it to their to the quote producer stepchildren. You know, it's not. And you know, my advisor Frank found that men are allocating help, direct care, among biological children and stepchildren differently. So he did find an effect of, of step parentage on on direct care of children. But I think because you have this intermediary of giving the food to your wife, that's going to eliminate that possibility. You know, and if a husband were to do so, were to give food to only his kids and not to his stepkids. It would not be a good recipe for a happy marriage. Not a happy Valentine's Day. Yes? Well, I could imagine a, a similar mechanism being at work um, mm -hmm. with the wife sharing with the husband's kin that it's, it's to maintain the relationship. And especially if you're married to a good mother, you might want to do that. Sure. To maintain the relationship. Yeah, you know, these kin relationships is, if you have a shared interest, you know, and and husband's kins are going to have a shared interest in your children as well as your own kin. So you certainly don't want to uh, slight them or you know generate any kind of ill will within the family. It's 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 very important to have good relationships on both sides of the family. So you you know building this the social capital with with both sides of your of your kin is very important. You know, and it's the kin relationship among the Hadza is just laden with so much respect and. Uh, and you know, even fear. You know, there's there's a lot of strict rules, in fact, about how you're supposed to be tr you're treating your in-laws. And so, it's very much something that people uh, talk about and recognize. And and you know, if a, if a if a young man is living in a a camp with his wife's parents, he's he's supposed to treat her like that. Those are his parents. You know, he's supposed to give them that much, even more respect. You know, and and, and how they do these things. And and so, gener generating this good feelings of and social capital is very important across across kin for sure. Yes? I'm just curious about the, the over fifties where you get the, the sudden drop off in over six over over sixties. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who looks after provisioning them and, and what's their role in the group? Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question because, you know, the there is a very, very important role in Hadza society played by elder individuals, um, and their food production is, you know, especially women is is quite high until it's quite quite old. But um, but there does reach a point where um, the the elders have to be cared for rather than being able to care for others. And I've seen this make a huge change in people's lives. I mean, it's it's. Um, People who I've known have gone so far as to completely give up foraging and to go live in a village where they can better take care of their um, elderly parents. I've seen this major shift occur just to take care of parents. When I returned to, uh, when I returned to the field this last November, a group that I hadn't seen living in the hills foraging um, had just done so. They had relocated to, to keep hunting and gathering again, and it was because you know this this very elderly father of, of a woman who I know had passed away, and so um, they had up until that point really completely changed and reorganized their lives to help take care of this this man who had who was blind. Um, but you know the 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 care of older elders is is uh, is this kind of thing where I've asked I've asked people one of the research questions, one of the interview questions I do is, who do you respect most in this camp? And, you know, the, the elders are given a huge amount of respect, and the sort of responses people give you for why they respect them is like, look, these people, if it wasn't for them, I would not be here. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here today. I, I owe it all to them, you know. And so, so these, um, this, this obligation to elders is something that is very, very long-term and very Taken, taken very seriously, you know. So, um, people will go to drastic measures to, to accommodate, you know, the elder members of their family. Yes, Dan. So I'm, I, I want to return to this sort of tension between your findings and Nick's earlier work and other yeah. people's. Um, and and uh, I'm just kind of feeling around the dark here. But one thing that struck me about um, your results is this: I think it was 74 percent. Um, producer is, is um, retaining the hind limb 
Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and if, um, so here's my, my empirical question is, yeah. um, uh, are there uh, norms or folk models about the division of game in, in terms of the process of butchering such that that is seen as a chunk, right? That's kind of an indivisible thing. Yeah. Because yeah. The, it, your, your um, passing remarks about people's dishonesty about honey success, for example, resonates with um, uh, my field experiences where people lie all the time and, and about when other people essentially place yeah. demands on them for sharing. And yeah. one of the things that you can do is, you, you, to the extent that resources are fungible, you try and put them into indivisible chunks. Right? Yeah. And then you say, well, I'd love to share you with you, but you know, I got this chunk, right? So if you have a yeah. large game animal and you know yeah. there's a lot of tolerated theft going on, you mm -hmm. have all these rounders that you have to um, a, a, appease because it's costly to try and fend them off yeah. and so right. on. Um, but you can say, well, you know, you guys get those parts, but this is my part, and this is an indivisible part, right? I'm going to yeah. walk home with a fever. Or is it yeah. the case that you can say that, that scroungers can say, nah, you know, give me a piece, right? Yeah. Let, yeah. let me have some of that good meat off the back thing. Yeah, the 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 hind limb is is a good example to, to to talk about that that issue. It does make a mighty portable element of the animal. So you can separate the femur, and it like I showed that picture, throw it over your shoulder and be gone relatively quickly. And so if you were time limited under this sort of scenario that you talked about, where people are 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 careful to grab what they can before others start contesting it, for sure that would be one of the pieces you'd want to hack off real quickly and and leave with. Um, so it's a good observation that you would predict that under these sort of contested situations. Um, and there are folk ideas about, you know, what is the proper way to share an animal. And these things are, um, you know, what I've been able to uncover is, is that, you know, it's, it's, it's perfectly fine to take the hind limb. You know, that's sort of okay, you know, if you're a producer. Um, and it's perfectly fine too to cut out what's called the salala, which is the tenderloin. You know, that's that's something that's okay. You know, you've you've you're the one who's killed the animal, you can take that, you know. And and I've actually had these sort of dialogues with people where I'll I will say, well, okay, well, what about, you know, what about taking the skin? You know? Uh, and I'll go, oh, okay, that's fine too, because you know, you sleep on it. You can you can take that. It's okay. But nothing else, nothing else. Okay, all right. Well wh what about the head? Well, okay, yeah, you can take the head too, you know, if but you know, more is selfish. More you shouldn't take anymore. More is like really selfish. And the question that I put to a person who I, I had that exchange with, I said, "Well, okay, that's selfish. But are there any selfish people around here?" And the response I got was, "There are many. You know, <laughs> there are so many. So, um, so these folk models. And, and again, you know, if I were a, um, if I was just an ethologist and I didn't interact at all with the Hadza, I would have a totally different idea about how they share food than if I talked to them, because the folk model does not map on to the to the to the observed behavior. Um, the, uh, the 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 thing that I've always heard is, you know, if there is a distribution going on of a large animal, this is women's business. This is women's work. You just kill the animal and step aside and let the women take care of it. You do see that. You do see that. I'm not saying it doesn't occur, but you just as often see men getting in the mix, you know, and having their say about who gets what and taking what they want and carrying away pieces. So, so the folk model has more of sort of a noble ethos to it than what I'm observing. And maybe what I've observed is a complete moral breakdown among the Hadza. Just to put that out there as a possible explanation. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yes? Did you consider trying to document networks of reciprocity? Yes. Um, reciprocity is another dimension to these analyses that, that um, I, I sort of fearfully tread upon because there's already a, a sort of a debate about reciprocity with Hadza, mm -hmm. and large, in particular with large game. So what I've done is taken a step back actually and done a network analysis of people's preferences for sharing. So unconstrained by reality, who would you like to share foods with? I asked people, imagine coming back to camp and you had three animals, if it's a man, or three large tubers, if it's a woman. And I say, who would you share these with in the camp? And they, you know, nominate other people who they would like to share with. So that's completely unconstrained. And, and I think actually because reciprocity, the data we can collect of actual food sharing is so stochastic in a lot of ways and quite messy about 
different competing goals, I think these preferences are very important to, to collect and to understand, is there even a norm of reciprocity? And I've analyzed these uh, networks, and there is a, a significant effect of if A is nominated B as a person they'd like to share with, B is more likely to nominate A, independent of uh, kinship. But, however, I've also found that reciprocity can sort of be a, um, a pseudo-phenomenon, or an epiphenomenon, because men oftentimes nominate other men as people they'd like to share with, and women nominate other women as people they'd like to share with, and individuals also nominate close kin as preferred sharing partners. So both those things, the sex and the kinship, are, are symmetrical traits. So if you just say, I want to share with people who are the same sex and who are closely related to me, you end up with a, 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 a reciprocal structure. Um, but, you know, the Hadza do re recognize a norm of reciprocity. You know, they, they, they recognize giving today to a neighbor should imply that later on, if that neighbor has food, you should also get some, you know. So, so there is a, a recognized norm of reciprocity. And I, I tread to, I, I fear to tread on this subject because also I just, I doubt that data that we have is really adequate to answer the underlying question of, of these recipro this, this, the operation of reciprocity um, because it can unfold on such a long time scale and so many different currencies and, you know, so I've, I, I haven't put that in this talk because, um, well, I, I might, maybe I should have. Should yes, Nick. slide should people with enormous racks have been drying? Yeah. Um, in all my time now, I've twice seen people drying meat. Really? Um, only. Okay. And one time it all got eaten up before. Yeah. We're going there. Because yeah. if you dry meat, you want to keep it. Yeah. Um, the other time, I think I've emailed you this yeah. one, um, was uh, in a very large camp, and I was very surprised to see this guy apparently storing lots of meat. So I asked around, and people said, well, his brother is very sick in the hospital, and he's got to pay the hospital. So yeah. he was going to take all this meat away yeah. to sell it to villagers. Yeah. yeah. And the. Um, Bushmeat trade has been growing and growing all over the world. Sure, yeah. Uh, in the last decades. I uh, wonder whether these guys are drying meat to, and yeah. hope they won't have to give it away in yeah. three days. Yeah, so I. They can sell some. The, um, the bushmeat trade is, a, is, is one of these, uh, an, a, another additional. Uh, consideration that we should look into. Um, I did not observe um, people carrying away dried meat to go sell in towns. I very often. I mean, I have two instances in my data set where people were taking meat out to go sell in a village, and I. One of those instances was uh, sort of a, a trickster, where a, a man had killed a hyena and filleted the meat after killing it, and his his objective was to go into the village and sell the meat. <laughs> <laughs> they certainly do not like to eat hyena, but if you tell a villager that it's warthog, maybe you would be able to sell it. So that was that was the uh, that was my trickster friend's scheme, and it didn't it didn't work actually. He he says he, you know, he got about halfway to the village and just threw it away and lost lost his inspiration to go do that. Um, so no nobody ate that meat, and I didn't include that in my in my data set. There's another case where. It was Christmas Day of uh, 2006, and there was going to be a big uh, festival in the near town of Damanga, the closest village to the camp I was in, which is was still about 15 kilometers away, at least. Um, there was going to be a Christmas party that was being hosted by a missionary, and the person who I was living with had killed an Impala the day before, and he and his wife took what they had kept for themselves out to the village to sell. So that was definitely an instance of bushmeat trading, and he kept more, he kept more for his household in the primary distribution of that share than than is typical. It was a standard deviation more than what they normally keep. So, so there's an instance of yes, there was there was a trade, and, and they were they were going to sell it, but in the, you know, 98 percent of other cases with large game, I didn't. If people if people were coming or going from camp with with large amounts of meat, especially, I was paying a special attention to this fact because the argument has been made that producers were able to keep more for themselves because they anticipated uh, visiting uh, friends to come by 
and to take shares away from the producer and then to, to leave with those shares. So I was especially interested in visitors coming and taking meat from anyone in camp. And what I found is that uh, when people came and got shares from others, they, would, they wouldn't just go to the producer's household. They would kind of forage among the people in camp who had, who had uh, any meat and ask, and ask for them. So, so there, was, there were visitors coming and taking meat, and if they did go away with meat, I would subtract it from the household in which they got it from in the primary distribution. Thank you very much.